and I want to welcome to the stage uh, our award-winning panelist and our special guest moderator, uh, NAOP board member and VP of Business Development and Public Affairs, and Millinder White, Mr. Albus Brooks. So come to the stage, Albus, who is also <laughs> one of the best dressed moderators we have ever had. So <laughs> thank you, Albus, for uh, being here today, buddy. Happy birthday. Thank you. Hey, and you know what? I think I, I would love to fight. Do you want to fight? Or is that not? Is that not a... <laughs> All right, that's okay. Are you serious? I am definitely not fighting. That is fun. I, I heard about fight night, but I never really thought like we could actually do it. So I may call you guys later uh, for that. Um, welcome, everyone. This is exciting. For If you are an extrovert like me, you've been dying for the last 17 months. And so... Um, it's exciting to get out and see everybody, see everybody face to face. Um, I have a lot of comments for a lot of you all because I've been seeing you on Zoom um, and you look different in real life. Um, I will leave those comments to myself on what you look like in real life, but wow, it's different. It's just different. That's it. So we're going to get going uh, today with um, our commercial forecast. We have some experts. I think this is going to be really really great panel, really informative. I want you guys to be thinking of some questions um, to engage our panelists today. I'll start us off with some, some good questions, but please be engaged. Don't just sit back. Um, we're in a really, really interesting and fascinating time. Um, and I'm so glad I'm in the Denver metro area and not in some other areas across America. Uh, we are supposed to be one of the fastest growing cities coming out of the uh, pandemic and uh, we'll see if that is true um, but it's really exciting to be in the Denver metro area I served uh, with Mayor Hancock on his, I was his co-chair for uh, during the pandemic and coming out of the recovery and it has been amazing to compare Denver uh, from vaccination rates to our economic development opportunities to retail all those things to other major metro counties and to see how far ahead we are and so that's really exciting. Let's get going uh, with, our, with our panelists. I want to introduce, I, actually, let's bring all the panelists up and I'm going to introduce you one by one. Um, we have some great folks. We got Charlie Will, Vice President of CBRE. He's going to be focused on investment. You can give it up for him. He's been up since 2 a.m. Uh, with, his, with his babies, so. Uh, you look good, though. You know what I'm saying? I, 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 you're one of the people off of, you look really good in person. Okay. Um, Andy Helm, I won't tell the people who look, who look different. I won't say bad, different. Um, Andy Hellman, Senior Vice President of CBRE Multifamily. Give it up for him. <laughs> like the jacket, sports coat, look good. All right. Tyler Carner, he's Executive Vice President for CBRE, focused on industrial. All right, John Weisger, I'm going to get your name wrong, your last name, I always get it wrong, I'm sorry. Uh, John is a senior vice president for CBRE, focused on retail. Next up, we got Todd Wheeler, vice chairman at uh, Cushman and Wakefield, focused on office. And last but not least, we have Eric Tupler, Senior uh, Managing Director at Denver and Salt Lake City, Office Head of JL Capital Markets. So how we're going to structure this today is uh, each of these individuals are going to give us an overview um, of their product type and their expertise uh, for about five minutes. And let me be very clear, it is five minutes. Um, so, you know, as a former political guy, I'm really going to keep you right there at that five minute mark. Um, and then after that, we're just gonna engage in some questions uh, here for the panelists. I'm gonna ask them some specific questions, but please be ready uh, to engage uh, from the public. So Charlie, why don't you start us off? Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. As Albus mentioned, I have been up since 2 a.m., so I do have a, a lot of coffee running through my veins, so bear with me this morning. I'm gonna cover investment trends and themes Specifically related to office and retail, I figured I'd save the, the easy, fun, industrial, and multifamily discussion for Tyler and, and Andy here in a sec. So 
We're going to talk about where we were last year, what happened as a result of COVID, what's happening this year, and some trends looking forward. So what happened last year, mid-March, COVID hit, and it hit hard. And investment trends are driven by capital flows, and capital flows and liquidity froze up virtually overnight. And investors didn't know how to underwrite. They didn't really know how to invest. And, and overnight, investing turned into speculating. And for those investors, they said, that's not, that's not okay. We're, we're not speculators, we're investors. So some investors kept a lot of cash on the sidelines, but most allocated equity towards safe haven investments. So tremendous flight to safety last year. That could have been for an office building, a single tenant long-term credit lease. For retail, that could be a, a neighborhood shopping center, grocery anchored. And for a lot of investors, let's be honest, it's, it's increasing allocations to multifamily and industrial. Next slide. So that, those are some of the challenges we faced last year, but the benefits that we've received here in the front range and being in Denver, as Albus mentioned, we attracted a lot of talent to Denver last year. This is our swirl map. We love this map. This shows 7,000 companies coming to the front range since COVID hit. That's 7,000 office occupying jobs. And that's just since last March. By 2025, CBRE projects 48,000 jobs coming to the front range, and those are office using jobs. So 12 million square feet of absorption in the office space. Where are we today? Last year, investing, unfortunately, flipped to, to you know, speculating. This year, and starting late last year, we had enough data points, we had enough forecasting, and debt actually became accretive to where it made sense for these investors to not just focus on safe haven investments, but climb out on the risk curve. So case in point, last year was, let's find a single tenant net lease opportunity. This year, as it relates to office, a lot of capital is being allocated toward a life science conversion. And that is the opposite of, of safe. So in some respects, investors are tripling their basis based on the prospect of life science and, and lab tenant demand coming. So very, very different profile from last year to this year. Last year, we were down about 40 to 60% for office and retail sales volumes. This year, we're projecting based on what's closed and what will close by the end of the year that we're gonna be on par with pre-COVID numbers. Albus also mentioned how Denver fares relative to other cities. These rankings are from a recent CB report that surveys 150 institutional investors, advisors, REITs, private equity funds. The top chart is for investors with over 50 billion in AUM. Denver ranks number three. The bottom chart is across all investors with you know, less than 10 billion of AUM to 100 billion in AUM, and Denver still ranks five. So, a lot of positive sentiment surrounding Denver and the prospect of our future and attracting talent and capital here. And really quickly, the forecast of, of what's to come, capital flows are going to increase. We know it's gonna increase for industrial and retail, but I'm here to tell you it's gonna increase for office and retail as well. It's not gonna be for every office and retail asset. It's gonna be true class A differentiated office Maybe it's a power center as it relates to retail, but that capital is coming back into the spaces. We're actually seeing it already. And ESG, I wouldn't be surprised if some people in this room are, are wondering what ESG even means, but that is a, a growing topic for a lot of our institutional clients, making sure that where they're investing capital has a good ESG score. And then lastly, we've attracted a lot of talent here because of our lifestyle and our recreation, but it's also been a relatively affordable place to live. And we might be losing that, and that's probably a topic for later on in the Q&A, but we're seeing home prices <laughs> going up 15 to 20% year over year in Denver, and, and I wonder how long that can go on before 
employers and employees start to look at other markets over Denver. So that's it for the capital markets and investment uh, trend overview. Thank you. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Charlie, and uh, thank you for being under time, which is great. Um, I, I do want to point out uh, one one point. I, you know, I feel like um, you know, coming from the public sector, now being in the private sector, I I, I see us get very siloed, um, and and really, when we when we want to think about our markets. Um, we have to break down silos and, and work with public sector and private sector to really have the best collaborative environments possible. And uh, one of the reasons we have businesses coming to Denver is incentives and working with uh, the government and also chamber putting things together to make sure that this is an attractive place. And I wanted to recognize some folks in here who are from the Denver Economic Office of Economic. And if you're from a Denver Economic Office, just raise your hand real quick. So we have some folks in here, and I think that's really important um, that we begin to blend that as much as possible so we can have the best collaborative uh, metro area possible. So uh, just a little point there. Andy, you are up, my friend. All right. Can everybody hear me? There's 17 seconds left, so does that mean I get an extra <laughs> 17 seconds? No. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, listen, guys. Uh, appreciate everybody. It's good seeing everybody in 3D. Um, you know, I, I put a lot of pressure on myself. We've got five minutes, I'll try and blow through these quick, but putting a lot of information, just a few amount of slides. So I wanted to make sure I was able to present something to you all that was, that was captivating and something that you can walk away going, yeah, all right, that's, that's meaningful. So listen, the apartment market, what's happening? We, we've been on a tear. Um, and this first slide, you know, I, I lost sleep over it. And, 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 and I, I lost weight trying to figure out, okay, what can I present that's really gonna you know, bring it home to you guys? And I think I figured it out. And, and right now what I'm gonna show you is, 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 a, is a graphic I put together that, that just proves how good things are. And, and, and things, are, things are really good, <laughs> right? Things are really, really good. Apartment fundamentals are really good. How are things on the transaction side? Again, same thing, I, I couldn't figure it out. What am I gonna present? I, f I figured it out. And things in, on the transaction side are, are really, really good. Um, and so I hope these two slides answer all questions that you guys might have about what's happening. Just kidding. Um, but no, things are really good in the apartment market, right? Um, the stars have kind of aligned and, and we didn't know going into COVID how it was gonna, turn out, but, but we've, we've really been blessed here. We've got uh, vacancy rates, which have, holded, which have, which have held firm. Um, we're seeing the most tremendous growth in all sectors during the second quarter. I think forward-looking, we're going to see that. We're now sub-5% on a vacancy rate. We're absorbing 50% more units than we're actually bringing to the market in new construction. This here shows you kind of the trend lines we're seeing, absorption versus new construction and what that does to your overall vacancy rate, right? Um, benchmark in our business, five to 6%, we'd like to call a healthy vacancy rate. We're now sub 5%. Um, and what that is equating to, obviously here when you've got a, a massive shift in your vacancies, that supply and demand curve really ratchets it up your rent. So, we're now seeing the highest rent we've ever seen across the city, and, and that's quite frankly <clears throat> a crawl across all product classes. Um, on the transaction side, um, it's been um, a, a, almost nonsensical um, trying to figure out. I, I'm, a, I'm a Denver born and raised, right? So I've, I've got to separate myself from the historical norms that I grew up in, especially in this business, to what we're seeing right now. And what we're seeing right now is just, it, it's, it's, it's history making events, right? Um, and we can talk about the, the, the whys you know, in more detail, certainly, but um, transaction volume is spiking. We've got um, more capital influx than we've ever seen into our space currently. Um, we're seeing uh, the market move, not on a monthly or quarterly basis, but, but almost on a weekly basis. Um, we've seen uh, over 20, 20, almost 30% um, appreciation in multifamily assets over the past 12 months. Um, you can see where we are from a transaction volume. This is quarter over quarter for the last five quarters. 
uh, six quarters, excuse me, and we can see what, what, what that's equating to cap rates versus transaction volume. Um, price per unit value change, right? Again, every single quarter this is moving. Uh, it's, a, it's a little skew just given the fact that second quarter of 2020 obviously was kind of the, the heart of darkness, right, when it came to COVID. That's when the world shut down and uncertainty was, um, uncertainty was certain. So we, um, we've, we're, we're starting to see things really start to pick up again. Uh, what do I know? What do I think I know? And what I think I know is right. But you know, Denver is a winner coming out of, out of COVID. And I think, I think that's across all product classes. Uh, fundamentals, I believe, are gonna sustain themselves for the foreseeable. Um, you know, we're going to see uh, a, a, a shift, more demand versus supply. Uh, rent, rents are still going to go up. We've got a nice discrepancy in delta between uh, what it costs to rent versus what it costs to own a home. And again, we can get more philosophical about that because I think there's, there's more color to that. But all in all, things are really, really good. And uh, Chuck Norris agrees. So there you go. Well, well done, Andy. Tyler, you're up. Thank you all for being here. Um, really honored to be here speaking in front of you. I'm up here in, on behalf of my entire team, Jessica Ostermick, Jeremy Ballinger, Jim Bolt. Really, any of us could have been up here today, but um, I'm honored to have the privilege to do so. Our team does industrial capital markets and industrial leasing, so I'm gonna try to blend those two together and kind of just talk about the drivers behind those and why the market is so, so hot. Uh, so the key drivers, these areas on the left over here, I'm not even going to talk about. These are, these are big drivers of industrial real estate. This one, probably if there's anything hotter than industrial, it's probably life science and bioscience, but we're really not even going to talk about that. E-commerce and safety stock. For every uh, $1 billion spent on e-commerce, you see 1.25 million square feet of industrial space is required. To put that in perspective, that's one billion square feet of industrial space that's gonna be needed over the next five years. That's four Denver industrial markets needing to be created. Safety stock, um, instead of just in time, it's now just in case. Just in time means hyper efficient supply chain to have just enough, enough inventory to deliver right when you need it. Now it's have enough inventory in case something happens. To put that in perspective, a 5% increase in inventory, 500 million square feet more of industrial nationwide. Just these two over here will create 1.5 billion square feet of additional industrial space required, six Denver industrial markets over the next five years alone. How does that relate to Denver? This is the Denver <laughs> Island effect. This kind of inner circle here is one day drive time um, to Denver and really what you can see is no major population center can get served by Denver within a one day drive time. In an era of one day, same day delivery, this is a big deal for Denver. Denver used to be the last place on the map you would put a big distribution center because you couldn't serve any other population. Currently, now with e-commerce happening, you need to be in Denver. And because of that, we're seeing larger and larger deals and more and more deals. But the other kind of metric, I think, to kind of to look forward into forecast here, which is the purpose of this event, is this region also is a low population. So it's also the last place that you'll build an e-commerce facility as you build out your network. So to look forward, let's kind of look a little bit at what the biggest e-commerce company in the world is doing. Because if you get on the phone call with our national colleagues around the, the country on the coast, every retailer is expanding rapidly. Every third party logistics company is is expanding rapidly. We aren't quite seeing that in Denver yet. Amazon is expanding in Denver. This is a mind-boggling chart. This is Amazon's growth. Each dot is a facility that Amazon has built around the country. This is the type of network that groups are gonna need to build. Not every group is gonna expand to the capacity that Amazon has, but what the world knows is that most e-commerce companies, third-party logistics groups, are probably somewhere over here. So this is what's kind of coming. This is why there does need to be more industrial space developed. There does need to be more land bought for industrial. And so some people think that there could be some 
oversupply or maybe too much land is being bought, but it, it is needed. Um, this is a, a forecast chart that we put together. The, the dark green is kind of the historical forecast. The light blue is, or excuse me, the historical record. The light blue is the forecast. We kind of say on this chart, six is the new four. If you used to pop above four million square feet, it was a really good year of absorption. We think we're gonna see you know, six million square feet of absorption for good years moving forward. There's 10 million square feet developed in Denver right now. Five million square feet is build the suit or pre-lease. So if you kind of look at six million square feet forecasted with five million square feet vacant, we're a market that's really in balance despite the, the massive growth taking place. And so kind of bring this full, full circle here, um, kind of back to the capital markets world, um, that demand that we just talked about through these slides is, just creates incredible pressure. Rent growth is happening in Denver. We saw 7% rent growth last year. Our markets on the coast have seen double digit and anecdotal stories of like 20% plus rent growth. You add to that the capital markets that, that Charlie was talking about of um, an over allocation to industrial and multifamily. It's a true wall of capital that's kind of um, hitting the industrial market. Um, our average CAs that we're seeing on deals is above 200 CAs. That creates about eight, one offer for every kind of eight to 10 confidentiality agreements. So 20 plus offers on deals. Um, so from a, from a moving forward standpoint, we see Denver you know, as a, a, or excuse me, we see the industrial capital markets as a market that will just continue to, to drive value and, and cap rates will probably even continue to fall a little bit more. I'm, I'm, I know I'm over time, but I'm gonna talk, Tupler's gonna talk about debt at sub 2%, IO debt at sub 2%, even at a mid three cap. With rent growth and sub 2% debt, you can get yields really, really attractive. That's all I got. <laughs> John, he just took your 30 seconds. <laughs> <clears throat> that all sounds good. I think I'm going to apply for a job in the industrial <laughs> segment. I'm, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about retail, uh, give you some ideas on kind of what's happened in the last year and where we're headed. Uh, this is kind of an interesting slide. What this really kind of points to, if you look at this area up here, uh, the, the brown or the brown line represents really the vacancy rate. And if you look at that, that's 2009, 2008, 2009 period. So what we've just been through in the 2020 era into 2021 looks actually pretty good. Uh, we're still, we were, gosh, 2019, we're 6.8% vacant as a market. And then we've kind of stabilized a little bit right around 7.5%. Vacancy rate, but really the the, uh, uh, the interesting point is what's happened between you know end of year 2019 uh, to end of year 20. I mean, a lot of happened in that last year, right? So let's talk just a little bit about that. Uh, this shows the average household income, which you know continues to skyrocket in the uh, Denver area. You can see the the dark green line is the Denver. Uh, metro, average household income, United States is down below in the red, and then Colorado Springs and Fort Collins kind of battle for second and third place. But those are great fundamentals. That's why retailers pay notice to Denver. Uh, this is interesting. This is retail sales growth. So really in the last year, we've had uh, roughly about 6% uh, retail growth. So we're, we're been up from you know, 20, 2019, 2020 was uh, fairly flat and we're expecting some pretty strong growth. So this is a real interesting slide and I know it's, uh, there's a lot here, but what this indicates is what has been the impact of, of the uh, government stimulus on spending habits. So if you look at this, this was kind of dating back, this is right April of last year, so you saw spending habits really plummeted uh, the CARES Act was enacted in uh, March 27th. Stimulus payments started April 15th, so you saw a real spike. So the dark, the, the dark green is the uh, higher income brackets. Um, middle income is, is in the lightest 
green and olive green, I guess. And then the uh, lower income, it's what's been really interesting is to see the spikes that have occurred when the stimulus payments hit the, hit the uh, mailboxes. Uh, this, this slide shows uh, what happened before, the, you know, during the pandemic, which were the winners and losers. And you can see that, you know, department stores were negative, uh, food services were obviously negative, and then that's translated. It's really flipped over year over year, March 20, 2021. Uh, this is talking about uh, e-commerce and what's driving the reliance on the store. So what you see is, you know, 12.3% or predominantly on, came from uh, online retailers. Oops. Actually, that's probably good anyway. We'll flip, flip to this. So this is, a, this is an example of uh, what's happening at Target. Target's fill, fulfilling more than 95% of their fourth quarter online sales in their store. Best Buy, 60% of their revenue of their online sales are being picked up st uh, in store or curbside. And uh, you know, what's happening is they're using their stores in a different way. It's more efficient for them to, to have you uh, get your product from the store, even if you're buying it online. This shows a bit about grocery sales versus restaurant sales, very interesting. In 2015, uh, restaurant sales started to surpass grocery sales, and you see a big decline in the restaurants happening during the pandemic. And now you see that line starting to even back to where uh, restaurant sales are equating to what grocery sales are. Uh, this shows the, just the full service restaurants making a comeback. We, we've already seen the fast casual restaurants uh, be very active, and we're doing lots of deals with those guys now. Uh, movie theaters will, uh, are kind of the last layer of the onion, I think, to come back, uh, but a lot of pressure with, uh, you know, with uh, the video products like Netflix and Disney Plus that are online. But they, the theaters have to differentiate themselves. That's the bottom line. And then this shows uh, mapping the, real, the, the retail opportunities and real estate investment opportunities. And uh, our econometric advisors have picked uh, Denver, either third or fourth place, on this map. So that's why investors are attracted to uh, the retail product. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, John. <laughs> Great, thanks. Uh, I'm Todd Wheeler, Cushman Wakefield. I'm here to talk about office. Uh, so <laughs> in our world, every night is fight night. You know, <laughs> Barry and I get on the phone and fight it out. Um, we, uh, it's obviously uh, been an interesting year, to say the least, in office. But as Charlie said, 12 million square feet of absorption is on its way. So I'll be spending more time on the golf course, finally. Um, inventory, we currently are ranking in about the 11th uh, largest MSA for uh, the competitive office market in the country. On a vacancy standpoint, we're slightly above the average. Uh, we, to, we tend to have a lot more uh, functionally obsolete product in this marketplace than a lot of other places around the country, so that tends to affect that number a little bit. Rental rates have actually held fairly firm overall. There's been examples of, of dips and people that have stretched the market somewhat, and every tenant rep broker out there says it's dropped 30%. But in reality, what's really been moving are the concessions, not so much the, the rental rates. Uh, and then finally, we had almost a million square feet of deliveries uh, in the last year, which is pretty uh, substantial. Of those deliveries, for example, Market Station, which we handled, we delivered at 92%. McGregor's going to deliver their CO. They were about 60% when they delivered. And of course, another project of mine, Block 162, is only 10% when we delivered. But in the last 60 days, we're now uh, in leases and LOIs. We're almost at 60%. So it's been a pretty dramatic uh, change. Still at about 4.8 million in sublease, uh, which a lot of people around the country pay attention to. But if you look at what a lot of those subleases are, they're in really tough real estate, they're not the flight to quality targets that a lot of the top tenants are looking for. So that sublease will continue to languish for some time. This is employment. Uh, obviously we had a dip in office using employment, but I think it was a lot less dramatic than what people expect and what some people talk about. You can see it there in 2020. And then our expectation, as Charlie had touched on, is that it's gonna rebound very quickly. 
Um, and we have a lot of examples of technology users in particular that have made 2,000, 2,500, 3,000 hires in the Colorado Front Range corridor, but yet they're still sitting in a WeWork for a floor and a half. So that's gonna change and there's gonna be some of that 12 million in absorption that's gonna come from that sector. This chart shows you kind of where we are in the migration of, of um, vacancy rate. The absorption is in the dark blue. And then what I think is probably important to pay attention to is the gray, which is the construction deliveries. One of the things that we've tried to explain to a number of our big tenants right now is they need to be out ahead of this construction delivery delay that's gonna happen because when that pipeline starts kicking on again, it's gonna kick on, and many of you know, it's gonna kick on at a price point substantially higher than where we were even with this most recent wave of product that came to the marketplace. So we're paying attention to that on the tenant rep side to try to make sure that we're not finding ourselves in a place where to get the quality of product that you want, you have very few options, you delay waiting for the market to come to you, and in fact, the market goes the other direction and delivers product at 20, 30% higher price. So that's something to pay attention to. If you break it out for just class A, this gets a little bit more drastic as to where you know, those deliveries are because they're obviously all in the new product and kind of where we expect to see absorption coming uh, together in the next year, year and a half, two years. Uh, again, even in the last 60 days, it's been, you know, our, our prospect list for Block 1 2 is uh, now 17 pages long. So it's been pretty exciting the last 60 days. In migration, I think we heard maybe 7,000 companies. I think that's a lot of uh, people sitting in WeWork. I don't know. But there are some significant moves that have been made. It's incredibly frustrating every time you read about the big new announcement, and there are actually four people in a WeWork, but that's going to continue to change, and we are seeing that. And we're seeing impacts from people like VF, which my team was lucky enough to be involved with, and seeing the sort of support groups that hover around big corporates like that. They're coming to town, and they're real office users and real rent payers, and so that's, that's pretty exciting for us right now. The, uh, oh, I guess this is two slides. There you go. So as far as the headwinds, and I'll close with this, what we're seeing in, as far as headwinds or difficulty in the office market right now are really uncertainty about what is the COVID return. We all are hearing this a lot in the news now. If we have more governmental shutdowns this fall, it's going to be a real problem for the office market. Sluggish return of dining amenities. I know John talked about some of the restaurants that are coming back, but the reality is you still can't get high quality dining as an office user in most segments of the market. So that's an area we need to see improve. Flight to quality is probably the other thing I would touch on, which is you know all of the office deals have really been going to new product, been trying to upgrade their presence. So it's creating a bigger divide between that product and you know the product of even two or three generations ago. As far as tailwinds, obviously all, all the things these guys talked about are really helping us. I think the biggest thing for an office market is that we are recognized as a tech market now, which is gonna continue to serve us very well. And then the final piece is just that construction pipeline that I touched on and the national awareness and focus that Denver has now. Every time we make a pitch, people are very aware of how great Denver is. So thank you very much. Thanks, Doc. Great, while we're loading, uh, who was here in 2019 for the event? If you wanna raise your hand. So everything we talked about then didn't happen, pretty much. Um, but if you remember, I did predict a global health pandemic. Not true. Um, and I think the reality of it is coming out of this event in 19, then to wake up in March, and the realization of our world was changing, I think from an investor perspective, from a consumer perspective, the new position of we don't know what we don't know, and the reality of that things can change very quickly has definitely been felt and will continue to be thought of as we make investment decisions going forward. Um, Denver is a shining star. We talked about in 2019 how we were at the top. We were different than we were in 2005 and 6. Um, Denver continues to be at the top, so it's great to be here. And obviously, new people are coming here every day to be part of Denver. So overall, from a capital markets perspective, Denver is a shining star, and it makes all of our lives a lot easier to, to decide on investment decisions, albeit the yields of investment decisions are really challenging. Um, I decided to avoid talking about yields, talking about you know, the 2%, 1.5% interest rate deals we're doing, um, and really focus on flows of capital. So what's interesting is we start with acquisition activity um, and transaction activity. We actually plateaued in 18 and 19. If you remember, we talked about it. What's going to happen? Can we continue to go up? Are we going to go down? And we dropped as a result. So 
Think about 2020 of we had a real first quarter, a normal first quarter from a transaction perspective, right? Because people went hard in February and closed in March or went hard in January. So first quarter of 20 was actually a real quarter, um, but the next three quarters of 20 were not, obviously. And the deepest and darkest days of 2020 were the second quarter by far, right? The stimulus, TARP came out, stock market plunged to 18,000, um, and everything just came off the rails and everybody kind of stepped back. We had probably more calls in, in the second quarter of 2020 talking about nothing that we knew was gonna happen than we do today talking about things that we think is, are gonna happen. But everybody wanted information, everybody needed information, and frankly, generally, people were scared, uh, rightfully so. We had never seen such an event. So we plateaued, acquisition activity, transaction activity dropped 30% uh, year over year from 19 to 20. If you look, again, talking about how much of our volume in 20 was first quarter, um, about a third of our volume in, in first quarter of 20 was our full year volume, where usually we'll see that in the fourth quarter. And we'll see first quarter being a little bit lighter as people launch deals in January into the marketplace. Um, we're down quarter to quarter, about 33%, again, from a normalized quarter of 20 um, in normalized environment. If you break down the product types, uh, we talked a little about the shining stars, a multifamily, multifamily down uh, 25%, uh, industrial only down 10%, which seems odd, right? You All you hear about is people buying multi and industrial, you see all the press releases. You would think that would be almost on par, but clearly there was just a lack of, of motivated sellers in the marketplace and a shortage of supply, which you can make an argument as really compressed cap rates as a result of that constrained environment. Office, you know, one of the bigger losers along with retail and uh, God bless John, every time he speaks, he smiles. I don't, I don't know why, but he does, so appreciate that, John. Um, you know, retail down 41%, office down 39% um, year over year, 19 to 20. Um, and then we really haven't started catching up on the quarter side. Um, you know, quarterly, industrial is down 52%, right? Even though everybody's trying to buy industrial, lack of supply, and multifamily is still down 20%. So we're really not at normalized transaction volume levels yet, which is creating a little bit of a pressure to put out money from most investors. As we pivot over to debt, the debt markets were pretty resilient. We saw the agencies lead us out of this environment in the second quarter of, of 20, right? The, Federal government said, okay, we're gonna start lending, we're gonna have a COVID reserve that we're gonna set aside for the risk, but we're gonna help bring back this marketplace. And really, Fannie, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, and HUD really drove us to investor uh, confidence of putting out debt capital. Um, so we saw debt markets drop 27%. First quarter, we're only down 14. I would predict that second quarter, we're at, at par with second quarter of 2019 levels of transaction volume, so back to normalized. Um, we've seen individual assets, agencies, uh, excuse me, multifamily was up 5% in debt financing, um, then led by industrial, or really yeah, industrial was down only 35%, although it's a smaller market set, office was down 48. Agencies up 18%, right, drove us out of it. Um, commercial banks, life insurance companies, and CMBS all down 30 to 35 to 45%. So again, a strong illiquidity, but has really come back uh, today. Pricing of, of risk is really the hardest thing right now. Multifamily industrial, you're getting 2% interest rates. Retail and office, you're getting 3.5 to 4.5, and, and we're doing a hotel loan at 7% today. So cost of capital has really been impacted. One of the bright spots that we talked about in 19 is alternative uh, lending, lenders, debt funds. Investors want to invest in debt. They think that they're better off getting 200 base points lower return by taking 65% risk on the asset. So we're seeing continued investment. In 20, we actually saw the peak of investors putting money into debt funds with 26 billion. And we're already first quarter of 21, we've seen 15 billion. This <coughs> easily this year could be a 40, 50 billion dollar market. And most of those vehicles will leverage three to one. So that 15 billion that was raised in 20 is 45 billion worth of dry powder available for debt investments. Forecast going forward, we continue to see strong demand from capital from mortgage loans. Um, continue to emphasize on multifamily industrial, although I would tell you there is rate fatigue. A lot of lenders are starting to say, I can't keep doing deals up 2.5%, um, which is going to benefit office and retail. So we continue to see those groups starting to look at more seriously and actually making debt transactions in those products. We continue to see a prudent lender uh, underwriting, which is good and will hopefully keep us from getting out ahead of our skis. 
Um, I'm going to make this statement because every time I make it, it changes. Uh, I predict we're going to have low interest rate environment for 12 to 18 months, which means that rates are going up. So you might want to go out and um, invest and hedge on that because every time I say they're going down or staying down, they go up. And every time I say they're going up, they come down. Um, and I think we'll continue to see growth in alternative lending sources and bridge, mezzanine, and preferred. Thank you, Eric. You're welcome. Everyone, everyone basically stayed within their time, if you're wondering, except for Eric, he was a little bit over. But it was good information. So Sorry, thank you guys, in incredible presentations. Um, hopefully you all learned a little bit, but let's dive a little bit deeper. I have you know, just some specific questions uh, for some of our panelists. And then, as I said before, um, we have a microphone, I believe. Uh, does anybody have the mic? And we're gonna go around um, asking questions. Jamie, I think you're going to take your, there it is. Just wave that mic in the air. Wave it like you just don't care. Okay, she's, she's going to work on that. Um, this, is, this is really for, for um, Todd and Office and then John a little bit and some retail. You know, uh, this is the question everybody really wants to know, right, is what are tenants really thinking um, and are doing about work from home and flex work uh, office policies, things like that? Yeah, that's probably the biggest challenge we have on the tenant rep side of our business is helping clients try to figure that out. So CB, our firm, JLL, we're all creating these uh, white papers to try to help them. And we don't know, they don't know, nobody knows. So I, I think what, uh, and, and we were talking Charlie earlier about the law firms in particular, or any of the professional services firms, um, and, and the ones that haven't adopted hoteling in the past, and now they are because of the catalyst of the pandemic. How much are they going to overreact to that and then revert back to needing to gobble up more space as they actually get more demand to come back to the office? Um, it's, it's going to be an interesting ride uh, here. Uh, and, and currently representing title sponsor Brownstein as well as Davis Graham right now and you know, two of the biggest law firms. And they are spending a tremendous amount of time and resources and uh, thought on how they're going to handle that. And I think they're actually being uh, pretty progressive. Uh, Sherman Howard was very progressive in the way that they're approaching it as well. So it's, it's definitely going to have an impact, uh, but I think it's going to make for better environments for, for them. And it also leads them often to make a flight to quality decision because they can execute a more flexible plan in, in newer and different product that gives them some of the physical attributes to do that. Yeah. Yeah. John, how about you? As, as we look at retail, um, yeah. how does that impact retail? It's been really, <clears throat> really interesting to watch this, but in the past year, I mean, we've seen actually the, uh, the suburban markets be on fire, not surprisingly. I mean, all the residential growth, but also the people working from home. Uh, so in most of the suburban markets, and that really includes anything outside the Denver core, uh, downtown core, uh, we've seen actually very strong interest in uh, l declining vacancy rates. Uh, certainly downtown Denver has been one of the last to recover and you know so goes the job uh, people working downtown that'll bring that'll be the catalyst for bringing people back into downtown but you know, our downtown market no doubt took a big hit uh, during the last year and is, is still just now we're starting to see more interest in restaurants and retail coming back but there's probably more vacancy on 16th Street Mall than we've seen in a decade so I got it. Char Charlie, you mentioned this a little bit, and Andy, I actually want you to answer this because this is a big question, um, big concern. Charlie mentioned that uh, there's so many components of Denver that is so attractive nationally, right? Um, but one of the things we're starting to see is the lack of affordability. And in the multifamily space, um, we, we do see rents uh, increasing. What do you think we do about that? What is, what's the answer? Um, everybody's waiting to hear this. Uh... <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good question. It's, it's certainly a, a challenge nationwide here in, in Denver. Again, the, 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 um, you know, we were, well, let's put it in perspective, right? My opinion. Um, you know, we were always considered an affordable market. What I actually think happened was we got a really good deal for a really long time. Right, this has always been a great place to live. People figured it out, okay? Simple supply and demand, right? It's the basis for economics. 
Um, so you're naturally going to get price increases. Um, to get more micro into that, we have, um, we're somewhat landlocked, right? We, we, Metro Denver, there's only so many places you can really build. And when I say build, I mean build to scale, right? You can't build west. We have these big rocks sticking out of the ground, right? And, and you can't really build south, right? South Highlands Ranch until you jump over, you know, to get to Castle Rock, you, you really can't build. So you can build as far east as you want. The question is, do people really want to live as far east as you can build? I argue there's probably some pushback there. So um, <clears throat> you've got a, a, a lot of demand, which is outweighing supply, which is going to be hard to build. I think the, the real answer is you let people build as much as they can, right? Uh, that uh, you, you can't. One of the biggest challenges and risks in our business, um, in my opinion, is political, right? To have politics try and govern um, economics, and it, and, it, and it doesn't work, right? You can't just say, well, we've got an affordability problem, and so we need you, developer, to go out and you have to build affordable units. But you, you can't do that, right? Because everything ties together. Right? If, if you're requiring somebody to build more affordable units, which we could argue is part of the solution, there's obviously more to that, well, that, that means their model, right? how they build, and the numbers that they need to achieve in order to build no longer work. So now what you've done is said, okay, well, you have to build affordable units in your project, but what that's really done is it's eliminated the project's viability. So not only are you not getting affordable units, you're not getting market units, and that just predicates the problem, right? Less units with more demand equal higher prices. That's just natural. You, let, you need to let development take place. Um, and, and it can be done intelligently, and I think in, in partnership with cities or, or counties and, and what have you. But, you know, you, you can't just stick a fork it and say, well, you have to build this or that, because if you, if you do that, it stops all development, and we have a situation like San Francisco does, or New York, or LA, or all the major cities which have required that to be a part of their development plans, right? It, it, it doesn't work. So you, you need to let the natural progression of development take its course. Certainly a complex uh, issue that needs many, many, many solutions Absolutely. and much more conversation. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, so Tyler, this is a, a question around um, industrial. There's a lot going on, obviously, a lot of excitement um, that's happening and with nearly 10 million square feet of industrial space uh, currently under construction uh, and there being groups planning additional development in all sub-markets around the metro area, how does Denver, how does Denver market look? Um, from a supply perspective. You kind of touched on this a little bit, but just- Yeah, no, it's good to talk a little bit deeper, but um, that, that is kind of the question. If you're, I, I think the, um, the key thing I think to, to get out there is, on, on my presentation I talked a little bit about that there is a lot of demand. Everyone knows there's a, a growing amount of demand for industrial. Um, there's a lot of capital, and so capital is trying to stay ahead of that demand. I think if, if you kind of dig into the industrial market and you just look at a map, of all the potential development that's, that's out there, it's kind of scary. Um, just because you're just looking at dots on a map and saying so-and-so is gonna build this and, and there's five projects there and there's eight projects here and there's 12 projects over there and you add up the total square footage of all those projects and it can, it can look like it's too much. Um, when you really delve into that, um, a, a lot of these projects are five to 10 year type projects um, some of them won't even happen. Some of them won't get entitled. And you kind of couple that on top of the amount of, um, of demand that's out there. The picture becomes a lot better. I think it's something we need to watch. I, I think there are probably projects that will get built because capital is moving so far up the risk spectrum that, that um, there'll be a little bit of uh, overbuilding. But it's actually a, a much better picture when you kind of look under the hood of hood than you might think. Definitely. I, and, and I just want to aside to that Denver International Airport, mm -hmm. um, you know, 1,500 acres of uh, development that the real estate department is looking 
I don't, are you considering, in, in your assessment of what's going on in Metro Denver, are you considering the potential growth? They're looking at doing a, a seventh you know, runway here pretty soon. Um, they're the fastest growing airport out of the pandemic. Um, is that a part of your assessment at all? I mean, the, the, the airport itself isn't a big driver of the industrial yeah. market from a, from a cargo perspective. Um, I think the airport's a big economic engine. So from the airport land to the land surrounding the airport, um, that, that is the area of kind of the bulk, gro bulk distribution growth. And there is a lot of that happening surrounding the airport. Okay, uh, Charles and Eric, I, I just, I'm curious about, um, you, know, you guys have talked about um, a lot going on in the market, but I'm, I'm curious, are there any new financing mechanisms on the, on the horizon for us to be aware of? Um, so, I, we've always seen new innovative financing programs come in and come out of the market. We saw EB-5, if you remember that, and when we came out of the last recession, today we're seeing PACE, um, PACE being more adopted um, and more readily used. Um, you know, absent of, of government-led financing options, and I would tell you that the, you know, the agencies, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, and HUD, FHA, continue to reevaluate their programs and, and try to decide on what programs, you know, their missions right now are affordable. Um, not the capital A affordable, like we think about it, where it's really restricted, but affordable relative to the zip code. Uh, and the demographic income of the zip code, and it's also green. So those are the two new waves. Um, absent of our government pushing forward those mandates, along with allowing for credits and things to be done in, in a PACE environment, we just really haven't seen it. We, we tend to be a privately funded financing market, broadly speaking, absent of those three agencies. Um, and if you're an investor, right, we talked about the investors going into debt, it's no longer life companies, it's no longer banks, it's no longer uh, syndicating you know, debt and CMBS. It's, it's private investors that want yield. Um, so we really don't have a lot of new programs. However, what we do have is a great compression in the cost of that capital. And it's, it's kind of, when we came out of COVID, the debt funds wanted to do every deal they could, rightfully so. They saw a discount to original value, uh, but they couldn't get additional leverage on their leverage. So most of those vehicles will leverage two to one, three to one. Um, so if you remember, you're trying to do a bridge loan in, two, in July or August of 2020, you're gonna be paying five, 6%, maybe even 7% on that bridge loan. That same bridge loan today, because that debt fund can go to the bank and get a repo line or node on node financing of one and a half to 2%, that, that cost of capital is now, call it 3% to 4.5%. So we've seen compression in yield. But as far as new programs, there really aren't a lot. Um, there are a lot of people talking about how do we scale green. Um, and I think there are a lot of, of private companies that see the importance of it. Um, I think most of those programs are led out by the federal government or state governments. And I think until, and Chaffa would tell you that they're seeing an increase in the programs they can offer. Uh, but I think, unfortunately, we're kind of a private open market economy from a debt perspective. And the cost is the cost, and um, you know, people are either going to pay for it or they won't. Yeah. Yeah. Anything on that? He's the expert on the financing. <laughs> <laughs> so here's, here's a question um, that I, I uh, actually, my favorite question. Um, and we're going to start with you, Charlie. And this is gonna, everybody's going to go across. If you had money today, what product type are you investing it in? Oh, it's easy, industrial. <laughs> no, if, if I had a, a bunch of money to invest today in Denver, I would, I would go downtown. I think downtown is, is out of favor to the extreme right now, both from a capital perspective and a tenant perspective. And when you look at some of the, the values or uh, basis plays you could make in midtown or upper downtown. So basically where we sit and going east, at some point that basis gets so cheap that it just makes sense. Sure, you're not gonna be able to drive market leading rents or really quick absorption, but when you look at Union Station and we're, we're selling the VF headquarters right now for 800 a foot, and there's assets you could potentially purchase in Midtown or Uptown for 
$150 a foot to $200 a foot, that spread is, is so big, I would take advantage of that. And, and the tenant demand has to go somewhere once Union Station is full, and it pretty much is. So it's either gonna go to Rhino, or it's gonna migrate up through Midtown to Uptown. And that's where I would put my money. It's okay. a good question. Um, I would, uh, I think I'd go the single family for rent model. Um, it's, a, it's an emerging kind of marketplace, but when you evaluate the trends that we're seeing um, in, in our population, um, and just the trends you're seeing in the overall housing market, it's a really captivating idea, right? The, the thought of, of renting a home. Um, and, I, and I'm not necessarily talking about you're buying a house here and a house here and a house here. It's, it's the community, right? Where you build a community around, around the, the for set, or excuse me, the for rent single family market. That's, that's where I'd go. It'll be interesting to see if we all say our own little, uh, <laughs> little box, but it's what we know. But I mean, what, I, what, I've, what I've always liked about industrial, and I think the world generally liked about industrial, is the fact that it, it didn't have relatively big swings. You had low, low TIs. You never really needed to invest massive TIs in turnover. Um, you know, from some extent, some tenants we talked to with COVID are actually saying, oh, I probably don't need as much office as I, as I did need before. So it's even bringing the cost of, of TIs down a little bit further. And you kind of, so you couple that kind of safety bet that, that industrial always provided with the, the fantastic debt you can, can achieve, the fantastic um, rental rate appreciation that's probably out there. And I, I actually do think that the spread on industrial is, is um, one of the widest of everyone sitting up here which is hard to say when, um, when it's aggressive. But um, from what you can build to versus what you can sell to, it's a widespread. So I would, I would, I would say I'm in the right spot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, OK, OK, John. Well, uh, I like the idea of the single family for rent. You know, I've, we're starting to see more of that. You know, we're, we're getting kind of broadening into more mixed use uh, uh, environments. Uh, industrial obviously has some great returns, but you know, I, I always sort of take the contrarian point of view, right? I mean, you kind of look at what's hot, and you kind of look at where there are voids in the market, where capital's maybe uh, not not as attracted to. And I kind of look at the you know both infill redevelopment spots, whether they're malls or whether they're just big tracts of land that are. Um, that come available in the market for various reasons, universities or you know, schools closing, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Uh, and looking at the uh, mixed use, uh, kind of residential retail component, I, I think there's actually some, some pretty good plays and people are, you know, I see some smart money looking at those opportunities. Uh, you know, uh, it's beating your head against the wall because you gotta you know, deal with all the uh, you know, bureaucracy of trying to get those deals across the finish line, which, uh, you know, Tyler, God bless him. I'm glad he's made it to another birthday. Uh, but uh, I, I do see there's there are some nuggets of opportunity, and it's just you know becoming a much more uh, market that requires a little bit more sophistication and looking at at these projects more carefully, especially the infill ones. Yeah, I agree with Charlie. You know, the spread in rents from uptown to Lodo, you know, was 20. Now it's 24. Then it goes to 26. Then you know, it's actually more like 30 today. So. We're going to see more and more users that are just making that economic choice to move back. So that's going to create opportunities for investors. Um, uh, but it's going to be a big, a big price tag, not on the buy, but on the amenitizing of those uh, facilities to try to get them up to snuff. Um, and then I think there's a lot of opportunities in the, in the suburban market, actually. We're seeing more and more users. We're going to be out with one today that's uh, several hundred thousand feet that is very focused on suburban market only. Um, and I think we're going to see you know, more of that, and, and even including the northern markets that really none of us really spend a lot of time in. We're going to see a lot of growth uh, all the way up the corridor to Fort Collins. Great. Eric, our finance guy. Uh, yeah, my, my first instinct was nothing. Um, <laughs> but then I realized I need to give an answer. Uh, I'm generally conservative, sitting in a lot of cash, although every day that I see real inflation, which I believe we have, I, I realize my cash is worth a little less. So I, I think generally investors need to go off the sidelines. For me, it's infill retail. I really like small strip infill retail. I think that's 
locationally a really good long-term play. Um, I like uh, industrial, but I like older industrial and, and really key. So I like distribution industrial, not flex. I like really solid old locations where you're in that the heart of that distribution corridor. Um, I like new office generally in, in barrier constrained markets like Cherry Creek. So, you know, again, it's expensive, but you know, it's it's always going to be the best. Um, and and multifamily, I like the brightest and the newest one um, to buy. But I would probably build multi. I would probably not buy. I would probably build. You can build a five and a half percent return on ca cost where you're buying at a a three cap. So I would probably build multi. And then I like luxury hotels. Nobody really touched on hotels, but I like luxury hotels. I think you can buy them at a really good basis today. And let's face it, we all want to continue to have our lifestyle of traveling and and going on vacation. So I really like luxury hotels, and I think that's kind of a, a contrarian niche right now that, that people are starting to discover, but, but could provide really good yields. That's a great point. Thanks for, for bringing up hotels, because I, uh, I think given all-star game and all this kind of stuff, there's been an incredible rise in, um, in occupancies in ho hotels, uh, downtown especially. So I have a, another question, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pause because we, we've got about 15 minutes left. And I want to make sure, um, I think we have a mic here. Um, okay, we've got a mic on each side. Good. So if you have a question, just put your hand in there. Don't be, don't be afraid. There we go. We've got a question right here. Thank you. Uh, you know, earlier, uh, one of your panelists mentioned the concept ESG that I wasn't very familiar with. And, and if you could elaborate a little more on that, uh, that would be helpful. Uh, the other question that I had was not so much what I heard, but what I didn't hear. And one of the things that I was looking for is how investment is tied to equity, diversity, and inclusion, because that's an important value for all of us. And so could you spend a few minutes talking about how you look at that particular section? ESG, let's do that first. I think I brought that up, so I'll, I'll tackle the, the first part of that. So ESG stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. And the goal of that is to invest in sustainable, sustainable assets. The social piece of it tackles the second part of your question in, in hopes of that. And then governance is uh, how much red tape is there in the, the, the micro market or the building or the overall city you're investing in. So each building gets a, an ESG score. For example, you could go put money into a REIT stock and you can look up their ESG score. Or I don't know if Todd runs into this on his buildings that he's trying to lease, but you could have a building with an ESG score of 40 versus 20. And even, even tenants get ESG scores from Standard & Poor's. So it's a way to measure how environmentally friendly you are, how socially accepting and inclusionary you are, and, and the governance of buildings, tenants, markets, et cetera. Yeah, on the user front, we're seeing companies actually in their RFPs demand that the properties be accretive to their ESG scores. So a lot of ways we do that is in carbon capture or in you know, carbon impact um, and trying to help them, you know, uh, achieve what they're trying to achieve. So that's a big part of our proposal process. And now it's actually entering its way into leases, uh, believe it or not, uh, particularly with the big corporates. So it's become a big issue. Yeah. Who, who, does, who, who does the score? Who's like the, the, uh, the standard and pores? Standard and pores. Familiar with? Yeah. yeah. Huh. But an, an example is the New York State Teachers Pension Fund committed to getting rid of, of fossil fuels and their investment portfolio in the next five years, and they're really focused on transitioning from fossil fuels to sustainable assets, and that could be real estate, commercial real estate. I, I like the, the other question about uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and there actually are institutional funds who are focused on that, and, and one in particular um, that I've been having a conversation with, and we're looking at one of them for our developments is Prudential, is looking for developments that have uh, that affordable piece and is being led by uh, folks of color on the development team. And so that is, and I don't even know if, if, if you all know some investment funds that are looking at that, but that was one of the few that I had heard of in the market, and I think that's a, an excellent question. 
Um, any others? Questions? We got this table's hot over here. Okay. <laughs> Tom. She gave me the mic. Um, Sarah May with Regency Investment Group. Um, my question is related to how hot the market is now, record low cap rates, record high sales prices, and just wondering what buyers are doing who are buying in this market to mitigate future risk. Who wants to take that on? I'll take it. Hi, Sarah. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think uh, with in particular to multifamily, there's, there's a, 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 a thing, a longevity, a, a flight to safety, and certainly we saw that resilience through COVID, but if you look at it from more of the you know, perspective of like, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Something you learn in college and never really use in, in real life until now, but if you think about it, like what's at the top of that pyramid? It's, it's a roof over your head, it's housing. And, and listen, it's, it's a matter of capital versus product availability. And um, there's, there's just a, a, an imbalance between the two that's working in the favor of, of multifamily. And we're seeing that with the result of you know, increased transaction volume, um, but also appreciation. And again, as I, as I mentioned when I was, when I was standing up uh, giving the spiel, you know, we're seeing that movement on a weekly basis, right? It's just hard to track. And so um, I, I really think it comes down to um, a, a, a lot of capital chasing um, something that is uh, comfortable, right? That, that can be um, viewed as um, dependable long-term. I'm waiting. Okay, it looks like we're good. John, so question for you. Amazon, next big grocer. Uh, is that going to be the driver for uh, grocer anger, uh, future development? You know, it's, yeah. I mean, certainly they continue to have an impact and they continue to grow. What's interesting, um, and the answer is yes. I mean, obviously they had a much more innovative uh, solution to groceries, and we've seen it in other markets. Um, but the overall kind of impact of kind of what's going on, I mean, if you look at historically, you know, um, Amazon 60, 70 percent of the e-commerce business, and what you're come, come to find out is, you know, actually their market, even though they continue to grow, their market share is actually continue, is declining right now. Mm -hmm. So you see folks like, you know, Best Buy, Target, you know, some of the one, examples, you know, that I gave on the <clears throat> did a presentation, but didn't get a chance to dive too deep into. But they're, those guys are all getting, you know, they're, they're doing their own distribution or they're using shipped or other types of uh, e-commerce uh, type delivery. But they're, they're all thinking about e-commerce and bricks and mortar. And uh, what, what you're finding, even with the likes of Amazon, is you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's not all about e-commerce. They gotta have some bricks and mortar, uh, hence their acquisition of Whole Foods, right? So, um, you know, I, I think you're gonna see much more blending uh, amongst, you know, the, the people that are kind of moving up to that next level in the retail world uh, in being more efficient in their distribution and uh, being more creative. We, we've accelerated, and the last one, the, the pandemic year served to really accelerate uh, a lot of retailers thinking in terms of how do they get products easier to their in the hands of their customers, and you know warehousing is a pretty expensive way to go. That's that's you know your 12% of your your costs are in distribution, uh, whereas if you're delivering pick up from store you know buying online picking up from store, uh, those costs get driv driven down, you know in the 8% range, and then it's much easier you know to return something that you purchased at Best Buy back at Best Buy, you know, the cost of returning something that's on Amazon back to the warehouse and having it go back up channel is very expensive, so. I, I mean, I, I agree with John, though, just to add on. Reverse logistics is a huge problem with e-commerce. Um, the amount of waste and cost is um, something that's a big, is gonna need to be solved, really. No one, no one really has a great solution on the reverse logistics side of things, and 
product is just getting thrown away, um, or if it gets back into the system, it's really expensive. And it does solve that a little bit, dropping off at the store. Yeah, it's about, it's kind of that last mile distribution, and those stores are one example of that. Got a question over here. Uh, Matt Langel, I had a question for Tyler regarding, uh, you mentioned Denver Island, mm -hmm. when it comes to industrial space. Uh, so if you could just talk a little more um, in regards to, obviously industrial is incredibly hot right now, but my understanding of what you were saying was because there's not as much of a population to drive to within a mile, that that's more of a negative. But I was curious, just from a transportation standpoint, in the sense of, you know, um, our, uh, our airport continuing to grow year over year, uh, distribution, um, mm -hmm. how that plays into the industrial market in greater Denver. Sure, yeah. I, I think the right way to answer that is it, it was a negative. If you were kind of running a supply chain, Denver would have been the last place you would have put a large uh, distribution warehouse because it just didn't serve a big population. So all the, 10 years ago when we were in this business, we would one of the things we kind of touted about Denver, but in reality it, it, it probably was a, a bit of a negative, is like all the big names had a location here. So you could have a 200,000 square foot warehouse with like four good credit tenants in it. So you might not have that in like Kansas City or something because they're serving it from somewhere else. So you had small versions with good credit in Denver. Um, but with same day delivery and last mile delivery, now you need a big warehouse. And, and you, you just can't be a small version. You need all your SKUs. You need, you need to be here with a 200,000 square foot warehouse, a 400, a 600, a 700,000 square foot warehouse that didn't really exist before. Um, so that, that island effect, the fact that we can't be served by another market is going to turn into being a positive for Denver's industrial market. And, and we're on the early ebbing flow of it because of that, that kind of trend I was talking about. That It's also the last place you'll build, you'll, you'll build out your market. And we saw that with Amazon. Amazon for years was exploding everywhere else, and then they came into Denver. And now they've exploded here. And I think they're probably getting closer to tapping out. But the, I, could, I don't want to hurt anyone's confidentiality, but I could list eight, 10 groups that are in the market right now that are name brands for 200 to 700,000 square foot facilities. Wow. So I'm Mark Stella with Galloway. So this is a question to, on the multifamily side and the industrial side. And I was wondering if you could break your, kind of your primary buyers for those asset classes into two or three buckets uh, for each of those asset classes, just kind of how would you you want to go first? You want me to go, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. You sure? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> probably a lot of overlap. There's a lot of overlap, probably, actually. Yeah, I tell you, the, mar the market's diversified so much. It's a really, really hard question to answer. Institutions, uh, we were historically not really an institutional market. We're probably top two, three on most major institutions, right? Um, so obviously, that's a bucket. Um, family office is, is another bucket. Uh, we're seeing a, an extraordinary amount of wealth exit the coast and finding Denver to be the kind of bullseye for their, for their desired landing spot. And so I would say that's, a, that's an emerging um, buyer profile, which is becoming pretty prevalent. And, and you know, some of these family offices are incredibly liquid and, and willing to pay um, big numbers, but, but also develop scale. And so that is really kind of, you know, blending in with some of that institutional space as well. You've got your syndicators, which are, um, we see a new one coming to town every single day and they're real um, and they have money behind them. And then you're, you're high, kind of high net worth, right? It's four buckets, sorry. <laughs> you know, in our, in our bucket or in our world, Honestly, most people are, are having a difficult time competing with the core funds. And, and, and what, um, kind of a, what we saw basically happen, about five years ago, Denver was not on the list for the, the core funds. There was the institution, but it wasn't a core fund market. They weren't even able to allocate money to Denver. So they, their more kind of higher yielding investment vehicles were in Denver. And about five years ago, a switch got turned on and Denver popped on the map for, it could, core money could come into capital, or excuse me, core money could come into Denver. 
and it, it immediately lowered cap rates. It lowered them to like that low four cap range that, that Denver's really kind of been at for the last, um, you know, call it four or five years. The, the allocation of money into industrial that's really happened since COVID, the last nine months, from office, from, multi, or from hotel and from retail, has really made another, another jump happen in industrial real estate where you've got the KKRs and the Starwoods and the Walton Streets and these groups that have so much capital that never could invest in industrial because you couldn't get enough capital out and now they can only invest in, in industrial. So it's, it's just a, a, a tidal wave that has, has really made it hard for anything but core buyers to, to they have to just move up the risk spectrum to, um, if you're not a core buyer to, to uh, acquire property. That, that was a great way to end this incredible session. Yep. So thank you for that question. Okay. We, um, will you guys please give it up for these panelists? They've been amazing. <laughs> Hopefully you walked out of here with some um, perspective, uh, you know, that you learned something and were able to, to be, to be able to use it uh, in your context today. This is this was really good. Um, so I, I wanna thank, uh, once again, Brownstein, Hyatt, Farber and Shrek for sponsoring um, this in-person uh, forecast, which was so awesome. So thank you, Brownstein. Uh, we, we hope to see all you all at the um, at NAOP's Real Estate on the Rocks. Uh, that's just on July 28th, coming up here. Please visit the NAOP website. If you don't know what that is, it's www.naop slash colorado.org for more um, details on, on the upcoming events. Also, for those who are interested in the new prospect member orientation, that is going to be in the back here. Yep, great. Um, I really encourage you all to, to be a member. I have, um, this is my first time being a member this year and it's been incredible. So, um, and, and definitely worth your time. Very, very valuable. So thank you guys for being here. Have an amazing day.